Bala Muhammad versus Diego Lima. We got minus 325 on Bala Muhammad and plus 250 for Diego Lima. Let's start off with Diego Lima, who's coming back after, um, I believe, a couple injuries, not to mention the fact that he hasn't fought since UFC 243, which was the same night that Israel Adesanya claimed the middleweight title after he defeated Robert Whitaker. So that was October 2019. It's been a long time. I'm trying to do the quick math in my head. We got 12 months, um, 16 months, roughly a 16-month layoff, so close to a year and a half off. Uh, not uh, ideal, especially when you're coming back against a guy like Bilal Mohammed, who brings an all-around MMA game. But we're talking about Diego Lima here, who's on a three-fight winning streak. Um, he started that winning streak by cashing as a huge underdog at plus 325. I believe I was live at that fight at uh, UFC 231. I might be off on that, but it was in Toronto. Knocked out Chadler Preeze. Uh, I believe that was a first-round KO for him, and that sparked a three-fight winning streak where he went on to defeat um, Court McGee via decision, and he uh, defeated Luke Jamal uh, via decision as well, too. That was a split decision. I'm not sure exactly why. That was a you know, one-way traffic, in my opinion, you know, very, very much favored for Diego Lima. Now, Diego Lima is a guy that I've wanted to pretty much fade in every single one of his fights. I'm not sure what my qualm is with him, but I feel like, or I felt like he used to have a very beatable style. You know, I faded him against Jesse Taylor, and that paid off for me. I got that minus 170 on Taylor there. Luckily, he dispatched him in that second round uh, via submission. I don't know why, but I skipped the uh, Yushin Okami fight, but that seemed like a tailor-made fight for Yushin Okami to go out there and uh, outgrind a guy like Diego Lima, and uh, that's exactly what he did. Chad Laprise, obviously I was not going to pay that minus 400, and luckily I didn't. He got knocked out there. I did pay uh, that minus 150 on Court McGee, as I thought he had a similar style to a Yushin Okami and a Jesse Taylor. Unfortunately, uh, a 2019 uh, Court McGee is not able to get the job done there. And then Luke Jamal, I think I actually bet Diego Lima in the Luke Jamal fight because I was quite impressed with what we saw from Diego Lima in his fight before that. Now, um, with with Diego Lima, you're talking about a solid striker. Everybody knows his brother Douglas Lima, Bellator champ, um, you know, uh, has been making a name for himself on the, over there. And Diego Lima, been on the Ultimate Fighter, um, shows a solid skill set. You know, I mean, great Muay Thai fighter. Black belt in jiu-jitsu, ever-improving takedown game and jiu-jitsu game as well. Uh, but he makes a lot of his solid movements on the feet. And the one thing that I like that he's been adding to his arsenal is that calf kick. Absolutely torched the lead calf of Luke Jumao. And that's a skill that I believe that a lot of fighters should uh, start to implement. I think that's a, that's a solid um, game plan to to revolve your, your, your fight around, your strategy around. Especially when you're fighting a guy that isn't primarily a, a striker like uh, Bilal Muhammad. Bilal, more like a all-around MMA guy, right? Doesn't really have a background in one thing, but is just a good, great jack of, jack of all trades. Uh, but if Diego Lima was fighting a guy like, you know, Rafael Fiziev or or a um, Piotr Jan or something like that, obviously they're completely different weight classes. But what I'm trying to say is guys that are kickboxers, Muay Thai artists or or strikers, uh, they are usually a little bit better in terms of checking those types of kicks. Whereas I feel like it could be very effective against a guy like Bilal Muhammad. Um, he's long. He's six foot two. He's going to have about a three inch height advantage. He's going to have a three inch reach advantage as well too. So maybe he could use that length in terms of how much distance he can cover with his kicks and really start to batter the lead leg of Bilal Muhammad. Now Bilal on the other side, again, I, I've pretty much banged on it this entire breakdown is that he's a very uh solid all-around fighter he's on a three-fight winning streak himself as well too where he's uh taking curtis millinder to a decision uh sub takashi sato at ufc 242 and then most recently we saw him win via decision against lyman good back in december and that was a very impressive fight because that was a fight that i i did pick lyman good to win i didn't bet it as i did believe it was a very close fight i don't think i bet it i'd have to go back and check um but I thought that Lyman Good striking would be a little bit too much for Bilal. But Bilal did a really good job in terms of making it a brawl, um, you know, getting takedowns, maybe not holding Lyman Good down, but at least changing the fight up enough so that it caused Lyman Good issues. I think the only round that Lyman Good won on the judges' scorecard was the third one, and the first two went to Bilal. But it was a tough one, man. He got busted up. Um, he ate some damage in that fight. Uh, Lyman Good just couldn't track down uh, Bilal Muhammad, who was just moving constantly, uh, changing levels, landing good combinations, and getting out of the way. 
Uh, but I feel like Lamy Good is a little bit more too too focused on the the head hunting aspect of his striking game. Like he's a great striker, you know. Tiger Showman trained, um, has a solid record of his own, has great experience as well too. But he had a lot of issues in terms of trying to track down Bilal, and Bilal was just on his bike the entire time, landing his good combinations, landing some leg kicks, and then getting out of the way. That's Bilal, right? He, uh, we'll never know what his game plan truly will be. Uh, given the fact that he's not, you know, diverse exactly in one specific thing, he's great in terms of blending the entire uh, martial arts world together. However, this line seems a little bit too wise. I mean, I feel like it has to do with um, the, uh, you know, the layoff that Diego Lima is coming off of. Because if it was fresh off of his win over Luke Jamal, is he really this big of a dog? Uh, Diego Lima like would he really be plus 250 I'm expecting this line to actually move uh, more so as this fight week goes on if I'm not mistaken the line is actually already moving yeah minus 325 is currently what we're getting still but I'm expecting a lot of people just automatically parlay below thinking that he's going to be a, a lock per se and I'm I'm not really on the tra- train there like I will pick him to win this fight. I do think he can mix it up well enough and add into the caveat that Diego Liam is coming off a 16th month, 16 month layoff. Uh, he has a lot to deal with here. You know, Diego Lima has pretty much uh, been spending his time at ATT Georgia, I believe it's called, uh, the ATT affiliate over there in uh, the Atlanta area, spending time with his brother. Um, you know, Cody Durden's another guy that he's been spending a lot of time with as well, too. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Diego Lima, you know, hop over to the main ATT gym to get in a couple rounds and get some days in there. Uh, and then Bilal Muhammad, we obviously know him, uh, spending time up there in Milwaukee, if I'm not mistaken. But he's been uh, spending time with his uh, his primary striking coach, Joe Valley, I believe his name is. And I think that's out of Chicago. So I'm not sure how much time he's actually spending over at Rufus Sport either because, you know, just glancing through his IG, you can see he's pretty much been training uh, primarily at that Joe Valley gym. So I'm not sure who really gets the advantage in terms of who's coming from the better training camp at this point in time. I believe Bilal did spend a little bit of time down in Florida as well too. I think that was in preparation for Lyman Good. I might not be, I, I might be off on that. Um, but man, th- this is a closer fight than the odds suggest. So I'll pick Bilal Muhammad to win, but do not be, uh, you know, thrown off if you see me actually make a Diego Lima bet this week, depending on what the odds get. Like, if we get plus 400 or something, plus 350 um, for Diego Lima, I, I might be forced to make a bet here. Like, uh, let me let me just pull up my calculator in one sec in terms of uh, the implied odds here. I want to give you guys a solid uh, read here. So, with, with Bilal Muhammad currently being... Where is he at? Uh, Bilal Muhammad currently being a minus 325 favorite. That puts him at a 76% implied. What would make him... A, or Let's see what 20% is. 20% would be plus 400 for um, for Diego Lima. I think he has a better term than that. I'd say 25 to 30%. So even if we put him at 30%, um, that would make him plus 233, which makes him even bettable at this point in time. Um Man, uh, Bilal just mixes the game together so well. I think the more technical striker here is Diego Lima. And then mixing that black belt, how much damage is Bilal really going to get off on the ground? Like, man, very, very tough fight to call. I'll say Bilal to win. But again, do not be thrown off if you see me bet Diego Lima here. I do think he has a path to victory with his striking, with his range. Uh, and even if he gets taken to the ground, I'm hoping his improving jiu-jitsu game will really help him uh, nullify the amount of damage coming from Bilal. But Bilal could absolutely control him as we're here as well too. So I'll go at Bilal via decision. Uh, but again, do not be surprised if you see me make a bet on Diego Lima here.